Yes, welcome back to the beautiful Congression place where we are now. I'm here with the next panel, and we're going to talk more about small satellite opportunities, because the availability of cheaper launch services allows for the development of smaller, cheaper science mission and also technology deployment. And I have a great range of experts and leaders here, and we're going to try and make this conversation interesting in the short time frame that we have. And um, just a quick introduction, um, Dr. Ed Liu, most of us have already met in the panel. We also have Slava Turashev, who is physicist and NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, we have Hannah Goldberg, who was on the panel previously um, from uh, Comspace, uh, Gomspace. And then we have um, Dr. Pete Warden, who's also joined us many times. And then we have Mark Shepper, Program Manager Hera, and um, Marino Popio, CTO Lux Space. And last but definitely not least, Chuck Beams, Executive Chairman at York Space Systems. And Chuck, I thought I would start with you with the first initial question, because you lead projects for the United States Air Force and Department of Defense. You also write for Forbes on subjects of commercial space industry. And um, I'd like just to get your thought on what you see changing in the acquisition and development of satellite technologies um, in the future, let's say both for government and for the private industry. Sure. Um, I, I think what we all find exciting about this, what I call the second space race, is that with the commercialization, the miniaturization of electronics and, and, and uh, the rapid uh, uh, companies that are figuring out how to use data in very new and creative ways, what we're seeing is this renaissance mm. in, um, some people call it new space, some people call it next space, but this idea that we can Everybody can be an entrepreneur in the space arena, and that's enabled by things like you talked about, the small satellites. And, and, uh, and so it's a very exciting time, especially to be a young um, scientist or engineer or, or anybody interested in the space business, because I see another great 50 years coming um, that will be different than the last 50, but very, very exciting in a new and different way. Mm. And I like that perspective of sort of the Renaissance era, even though it is a new, a new era, but still bringing sort of the old into the new, yeah. enabled by technology. Yeah, it's very fascinating. Um, and you see it, whether it's in, in Silicon Valley area mm. or all over the world, frankly, mm. just like there's all these celebrations of Asteroid Day all over the world. Um, what, what we're seeing is this, this whole generation that grew up with computers in their hands, mm. unlike ours, they, they think new and different and creative ways by which space is applicable to, to Earth, make Earth a better mm. place, um, and also to, to explore through mm. robotics, through these small satellites going and exploring other moons and, and, and all through the solar system. A very exciting time. Mm. Mm. And Ed, I was just w wanting to sort of catch over to you because you also have a vast experience within the space sector. You've also um, been up there in, in, in the universe as an astronaut. Do, do you sort of follow this trend that bringing sort of the conversion of the Renaissance into the new space? And is this also um, bringing the topic of asteroid and asteroid day more in, onto the horizon? Absolutely. I think we're, in, as, as Chuck said, a pretty exciting time. Mm. It, it is rather similar to the feel around the personal computer revolution, which happened about 25 years ago, mm. where suddenly computers, which were in the 1960s, giant, enormous things that filled rooms and were the province of large government projects, became small, accessible, and people could experiment with. Mm. And that allowed the growth of many, many startups to, to do all kinds of creative things. And we're seeing the same thing happen in space right now. We're watching small companies being able to launch small satellites on, on a rapid time scale. Mm -hmm. From start to the time they have something on orbit can only be a few years, mm -hmm. and, or even less. Yeah. And that, that's amazing. That allows you to experiment and come up with good ideas, try things, fail at some, and, and learn from that, and move on. And that's what allowed the computer revolution to happen. And we're seeing the same thing happen in space right now. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty exciting. And it's also the consensus of being more risk pro, which is sort of allowed in, in, in this era. More experimental. More experimental. That's maybe a better use of words. Um, Slava, you and your team at JPL, you've proposed a new small satellite constellation to find the sort of smaller, more numerous asteroids, let, let's say. Um, can you share with us how this technology works and um, how the new space industry that we've sort of been referring to, how that makes this mission also possible? Excellent. Um, 
we are living through a revolution in, uh, in, in spacecraft industry. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we benefit from several technologies that have been developed in commercial space. One of them is uh, uh, just very new high-performance cameras that we have uh, uh, seen in the, in, the, in, the, in the marketplace. So they are getting a larger, very uh, excellent, uh, very low noise performance, and they're very capable. Mm -hmm. So then computing that came from the gaming industry. And so now we have teraflop computing we can put on a spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And so uh, putting small telescopes in space uh, in, in, uh, with this technology is now uh, allowing us to study, uh, look for asteroids. And asteroids of different sizes, we were able to detect them in, uh, before they will approach the Earth's orbit. And so now with this technology, we can not only benefit uh, from uh, putting those telescopes on the ground, but also in space, putting a constellation of those telescopes. Five of those uh, telescopes placed on the heliocentric orbit around Earth, er, er, around the Sun. Around the Sun will allow us to detect majority of the asteroids within uh, three, uh, three, three and a half years. Mm -hmm. So which is very nice because knowledge of the asteroid orbit will uh, help us to um, uh, to uh, eliminate any possibility for the asteroids to hit the planet. Mm -hmm. So, which is very interesting. And this is we definitely benefit from the new technology in uh, multiple areas. Mm -hmm. So, the cameras, the, the high-performance computers, and the small spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And also the correlation of different industries now finding synergies. You mentioned so the gaming industry then sort of merged into the space sector. Absolutely. This is an exciting time because now we can uh, build small, small systems mm -hmm. uh, and uh, launch them in space at a very affordable prices. Mm -hmm. And so that actually changes the economics of uh, space, uh, space research. And, uh, and putting commercial uh, uh, enterprises in, uh, in, in this area. So that enables small companies to develop very interesting proposals and actually fly them in space in a very reasonable time. Not waiting for tens of years before you actually, from the proposal to fly mm -hmm. your mission. You can, you can actually do this in five years and develop very nice, uh, and, and, and have very nice results in studying asteroids, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, Mark, I wanted to jump over to you because you're program manager of HERA at OHB. And so we, we've talked a lot about HERA, the HERA mission today, but now we're talking about small satellites. But HERA is not really a small satellite, so how does she or he fit in in this? Good question. So as you just said, HERA by definition is not a small satellite. It should be just a third of the mass of the dimensions to fit into this category. On the other hand, it's much smaller mm -hmm. than typical classical science missions, which are much bigger, much more costly. Uh, and just comparing this, for example, to Rosetta, which costed about 1.5 billion euros at the end for the entire mission, this is just a fifth of this, which we're talking about for HERA, for example. So it's a step towards getting to smaller, maybe smarter, simpler missions. It's not really a small satellite. It's not really new space, but it's a step towards this mm -hmm. by implementing a leaner design process, having a small, smarter manufacturing uh, at the end. And as you just mentioned, things are getting smaller and much more powerful, like computers. It's a nice example always. Uh, some things also here are getting small, smaller and more powerful. For example, cameras, instruments to observe things are getting smaller, lighter, whatever, but they produce more and more data. So 10 or 20 years ago, we got some uh, pixeled uh, black and white pictures. Today, we get uh, HD video, including, I don't know, 3D elements or whatever. Uh, and some things you can scale, so you can say, okay, instruments are getting smaller, so you can have a smaller satellite, but other things you cannot scale. There are limits of physics, for example, getting all this high quality data down back to Earth, which you mm. simply cannot just scale by this. So you're creating even more data with a smaller satellite, but you've got the problem how to bring the data back home. So this is a step towards this, but especially this exploration, let's say, of the, the deeper space uh, has some limits. And that's then the second point why HERA fits into the small SAT discussion at the end, because it provides an opportunity for two CubeSats, so small, mm. cubes, uh, small satellites in the order of 10, 12 kilograms, which we bring to the asteroid, deploy them there, and then they can do their job there. They can provide additional information, data um, of the asteroid, and as was mentioned before as well, uh, they can, the small, smaller satellites can take a higher risk by getting even closer to the asteroid at the risk that something might go wrong, but that's their purpose. Mm. And uh, could I jump from that to you, Hanna? Because I'm thinking GOM space, you also, I mean, you work with CubeSats. So, so how do you see that CubeSats, in addition to what Mark said, can actually help a mission like HERA? Yeah, Mark's exactly right. I mean, I think one of the advantages is we um, were able to take the smaller platforms uh, and use HERA as a taxi to get to the mm -hmm. asteroids. 
Um, so we, we don't need to get there ourselves. We can rely on, on the navigation and all of the resources from the bigger vehicle, and, and Hera can drop us off right there at the asteroid. Um, and, and as you mentioned, I think the being able to go in and take more risk is an important part of it. So we can, we can fly a little bit closer. Uh, if we want, we can attempt to land on the surface and interact with the surface and possibly even be you know, a little bit expendable. So if, if it doesn't work, it's, it's not the end of the world. But uh, um, by, by having these new uh, technology and miniaturized instruments, um, you can provide bonus science to the larger mission in a way that has never been done before. Mm. And, and just a, th a question that popped up in my mind, GOM space, what does GOM stand for? <laughs> it stands for grumpy old men. <laughs> I, I heard that the other day, so I thought like GOM, grumpy old men. How did, how did the company come up with that name? Is uh, it basically it, it, founded by No, men? no, it was, it was founded by, by people coming out of university. It was ah. a little more, uh, um, I think, uh, uh, people who had the, the willingness to, to put in the hard work and, and uh, make these, these challenging missions happen. So, so the, the, new, the new space era. And, and speaking of um, children, as we go from one generation to another, I think we have some kid interviews who have been out on the streets proposing a question that our experts then will give the right answer to. Am I correct? What is the difference between a cube satellite, a small satellite, and a nano satellite? Uh, probably their size and shape. I never, I never uh, heard about that. This is my first time. And I think the nano one is the smallest. Is it correct? Mm -hmm. He does well. I don't know. He likes likes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, so the question was, what's the difference between a nano satellite, a cube satellite that we talked about, and a small satellite? Does anyone? Yep. And then we have <laughs> yeah. Pete as well. So by definition, um, nano satellites, where most of the CubeSats are positioned in, goes up to 10 kilogram. Then between 10 and 100 kilogram, you call it microsatellites, and above that, you you have the small sats. Anyway, the the, the borders there uh, are somehow floating. And I guess uh, if I talk, can I switch to uh, my, my Please topic, do. Yes, which is of I'm here the CTO of um, Lux Space. Space. And Lux Space has, um, is, is an integrator of microsatellites. So we are positioned in a 10 to 100 kilogram region, uh, according to the definition. Nevertheless, our products are between 25 and 150 kilograms. So just to give you an idea. Mm. So... Microsatellites uh, might be useful also for deep space exploration and um, this asteroid topic anyway, um, just to tell you the case behind it. Uh, microsatellites would be used commercially in low Earth orbiting uh, application, and this is mightly, uh, very, very likely some constellation mission. And this shall be also uh, the business case for this product. And the idea is, once we have established a product which is mature, working fine, bringing you revenues, you can always adapt it quite easily to a deep space mission or uh, a mission which is more demanding mm. than to design for a deep space mission from scratch. Mm. So I think this could be a way to go. Mm. Because our microsatellites, as, as, as Jack also explained before, are, are now following a completely different philosophy than the old space or traditional space way of doing that. So we try to apply here clever and smart technologies which might come from terrestrial applications, automotive applications, for mm -hmm. instance. But um, not only that, it's not only about technology, it's also how to implement a development uh, project, for instance. You have agile technologies also in the management, in mm -hmm. the production, and this is differing somehow from a traditional way. And the benefit shall be that you have a much quicker turnaround time to a mature product, mm -hmm. and um, if you have a customer who is t willing to take some risk, um, you, have, you can even benefit from the economical situation, so you can offer products which are much, uh, much cheaper in price. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And uh, so, so I wanted to also jump to, to you, Pete, because you were going to answer the, the initial question from the children journalists. Well, I think one of the, the, the key things, the point I want to make is this is a revolution that is continuing. Mm. That, uh, you know, we're talking about kilogram class satellites, uh, but we're going to even smaller ones. Uh, this, is a, this is what's called a Sprite. Uh, this was made by 
students at uh, Stanford and, and Cornell, and 120 of these were launched a few months ago. Uh, so for the first time, we're seeing technology, and I don't know what you call these femto satellites or, or what the, yeah, and, and, but they're going to go even smaller. Uh, this is a sub gram class satellite that we're starting to develop. I, I, I lead the breakthrough initiatives where we're trying to figure out how do we go interstellar 300,000 times further away than the sun. And the point is, is this is a start. This is sort of a, you know, five gram. And this is a third of a gram. If it gets this small, and this is a complete satellite, it has a, a camera in it, it has everything a satellite does, we can attach this to a light sail and hit it with a very powerful laser and get it a thousand times faster where you can go interstellar distances. But I think the key thing, these things really have an incredible potential for exploring our solar system. You would send swarms of them, maybe thousands or tens of thousands, that could explore an asteroid, explore the whole thing. So I think the revolution is just beginning. Mm. And it sort of it pa paints a picture. We've all seen sort of the pictures of the future where we on Earth have drones in the air and uh, self driverless cars on the street and so forth. Is, is also space, I mean, there's so much technology going on. Everything is getting smaller, which means that it can be more sort of put up in, 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 into space. Is, is there a risk that, that we, I don't know, over-innovate and, and over-populate, whether it's with satellites or with humans? Are we sort of extracting things from Earth and converging it to space? Just an elaborate question that came to mind if someone just wants to, yeah. Sure, I, I, I think that's a, that's a valid concern. I get, uh, I'm the chairman of something called the, the Small Side Alliance, which, and one of the issues that comes up that I have to deal with a lot is that very concern. And the, the one th there's two things that I kind of look at from that. First, we're, we're, as, as Pete said, we're at the very beginning of a revolution, and, uh, and it's exciting. It's this renaissance that we talked about earlier. But, but I think that... It's not really a concern. First of all, space is really big, mm. right? And the other thing, too, is that it won't be long before we're actually extracting resources from space to go further into space. So I think, I think this idea, a lot of people will, will think about the pollution and stuff like that that's occurred in the oceans and, and, and the, the, the learning from those mistakes. But space is, is, is very different. The other thing is that for low Earth orbit, which is principally what uh, York is, is dedicated to, um, there, there are lots of safeguards in place by the responsible companies to ensure that they, that they will uh, retrograde back and burn up in the atmosphere. So there really isn't, the concern is it makes for great theater, it makes for a great movie, mm -hmm. but, but the reality is it's, it's not as much of a concern for responsible companies, and most companies are responsible. There might be one or two out there that, are, mm -hmm. that we, you know, need to be monitored, but for mm -hmm. the most part, my experience with all the members of the alliance, it's, mm -hmm. They're very responsible about that. I think I'm just referring more coming from the tech space, where now the discussion is a lot about, you know, unconscious bias when we're trying to program artificial intelligence oh, and so forth yeah. and so forth. A lot of things are, are happening, and, and, and maybe there aren't always roadmaps for it, because we, we are coming into a new paradigm, a new yeah. sphere, in, in, in a sense, a I revolutionary see, yeah. sphere. But, I, but I thank you for the... I think one of the advantages of, of the small satellites is uh, the challenge right now is getting to space. Um, there aren't that many rocket launches, so you can make as many satellites, but the smaller ones enable you to do more per launch. Uh, and you can also make the most of those opportunities. So um, down to the, the single gram level, um, being able to, to manage what goes on a rocket. So it's not just one satellite, but that one satellite can maybe bring a number of others and make the most of that opportunity. Um, so we have a, a number of missions we're working on for, for CubeSats that can uh, ride along with, with larger missions and, and wait for an opportunity of an asteroid to come. And then when that asteroid comes, it, that small satellite can go out and, and do good science and investigate, but it wouldn't be able to do that without the ability to sit in space and wait. Exciting. Um, also an open question, which I know that many of our viewers are posing nearly every year. I mean, how big is the risk of um, one of the major uh, asteroid impacts that we're now trying to deflect, of course? Is there any, um, any new news on that? And Ed, I'm looking at you. Well, the odds are in any given day, any given week, month, not that high. Mm. But you can't play the odds forever and expect to win. Mm. Um, there, there are entire cities, Las Vegas and Monte Carlo, which are built on this principle. You cannot win a game of chance forever. And so this is a long-term issue for, for the world. 
but um, this has been said many times before, I don't like to think of the asteroids simply as a threat. We really have to think about the asteroids as worlds to be discovered. And they're part of our solar system and they're where we're going. And so it's not simply about keeping them from hitting the Earth. It's, it's understanding where they are, where they're going, where the science is, where, where we as human beings are going. And uh, so I think if you look at this bigger picture here, it's, there's a lot of exciting things going on. And actually the next 10 years are really gonna make a big difference in our understanding of where all these asteroids are, what they're made of, what we can do with them. And I think you're gonna see a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone who wants to add to that? Yeah, well, yes. Sorry. <laughs> well, I would just add, like to add now that we have, since it is um, small sat related, mm -hmm. this panel here, now we have a lot more opportunities maybe than 10 years ago or 15 mm -hmm. years ago due to this um, quick turnaround time to realize a mission based on uh, small satellites. Uh, we can do much more and quicker. And uh, there are certain technologies which were not even available a couple of mm -hmm. years ago, aut uh, autonomous uh, flying, formation flying, everything very much out there in deep space. Uh, you need a certain intelligence on board to mm -hmm. act uh, appropriately. And these are all things where there is a lot of movement and a lot of excitement in the community mm -hmm. to realize that. Just as a side note. And so many opportunities for up and coming startups. I'm thinking of GOM Space and students who are here that there really is also in the small satellite space, there's so much opportunity because it's going quicker, there's, there's more leverage, there's also lower costs, but you can take higher risk, which has a good synergy. Mm -hmm. I would fully support what Marino just said and add a bit to what uh, Ed just said. So in principle, these smaller satellites provide us additional opportunities, especially in combination with a much easier and cheaper access to space, as Rusty mentioned, I think, in the first panel today. Mm. And this in combination allows a lot of additional things which we couldn't do 10 years ago due to cost, due to non-available technology, etc. And I think this, this class of the small satellites uh, offer exactly what we need because we do not know enough about the asteroids. We know some of them, we mm. do not even know all of them because we need much better observation capabilities, but that's another story. But even those which we know that mm. they are there, we do not know how they are uh, constituted, what their consistence is, etc. And to observe all of them or a lot of them with very expensive missions, nobody can afford. But using smaller satellites, 100 kilogram class, maybe larger CubeSats in the order of 10, 20 kilograms, might offer this opportunity to get a much better picture of the variety of asteroids, to get a better understanding on them. And this enables us maybe to also improve our deflection technology at the end because we know what to expect. Mm. Yes, Peter. Well, I think, you know, these are all very important points, but in the end, maybe the most important point about this trend to smaller things is, is the ability to do things quickly and yeah. to make a mistake and repeat. You know, the, the, the software industry grew because a bunch of people in, you know, their garage mm -hmm. could do something, you know, in a few days and then test it, and if it didn't work, retest it. In space, traditionally, you're your time it took and the money, it would took hundreds of millions of euros and it took, you know, years. Now with these small things, you can get down to today, less than a year. With these even smaller ones, you can get down to essentially the time of a, of a uh, software that you can do things in a few days, a few weeks, and then you can put them in space. Uh, so that's really important. It's important to be able to make mistakes and not have, have, have spent you know, a country's mm. national uh, wealth mm. on it. So it's, this is a really important thing that it's making it accessible to people with good ideas. Well, thank you for, th that's a perfect way to round it off. And I also want to encourage, because we have a lot of students here in the room, that, you know, if you're in the space sector, if you sort of feel that space is where you both have uh, innovation and uh, maybe some disruptive ideas, then small satellites is a good place to start. So thank you so much to my panel. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Cordelie at the Science Center. Thank you. Guillaume and Justine are still with us here. We're standing at this uh, piece of blue spandex. What is it meant to represent? Cordula, this is space time. This is a model of the solar system with the sun in the middle, represented by this steel ball. And the spandex itself is space time in the theory of general relativity bent by the center mass. Let's imagine we have a body floating around in space. It will be naturally pulled by sun's gravity 
Yet, if this mass has an initial speed, a tangential speed, then it will, well, float around the, the center uh, in an orbit that is normally a circular or elliptical orbit. So this represents our solar system with the planets? Absolutely, absolutely. It, it can also represent the formation of the solar system, as a matter of fact. Let's use these wheels and roll them on the surface and just take a look at what happens. We will see collisions, we will see accretion, we will see a lot of the phenomena that happened in the solar system five billion years ago when it all began. And in that scenario, um, asteroids are the leftovers from the solar system. So how come that these leftovers don't also kind of cluster together as we have seen happening with these bits that are floating free in this model? Well, the, the asteroid belt nowadays is quite close to Jupiter, and we believe Jupiter, with its its large mass, is per perturbating the um, the orbits of the asteroids, preventing them to continue to create and form a, a new planet. I think, Justine, we should try creating our very own new solar system here. Wow. <laughs> And with that, we go back to you at Circle City. Thank you so much, Quadrilla. Joining me now is Christoph Herrmann from Eurocomposite to tell us all about what that actually is. Christoph, thank you for joining us on Asteroid Day. I see you've got some samples, so please explain to us, what is this? Absolutely. So, hello together. Um, my name is uh, Christoph Herrmann. I'm uh, representing Eurocomposite. Uh, Eurocomposite is here uh, one of the main sponsors of the Asteroid Day. Uh, Eurocomposite is um, a Luxembourg-based company, a family-owned company, and Eurocomposite uh, Group has three facilities in Germany, in Luxembourg, uh, and in the United States. And right now, with more than 1,100 employees, um, Eurocomposite belongs to one of the biggest manufacturers for lightweight products worldwide. And since its foundation in 1984, sorry, 1985, Eurocomposite has acquired a very high level of um, technique and maturity for composite products. Um, that means mainly in aerospace uh, business. So our main products would be produced um, is just honeycomb cores, and I have brought some samples with me. So this is actually the so-called honeycomb core, and then the added value, what we produce out of this core are, for example, floor panels, laboratories, toilets, and especially for space, I think this is quite interesting and um, important to mention here right now, we're producing structures, satellite structures, and as well, solar array, substrate panels for satellites. And yes, um, we have invested since um, the last two years more than 15 million euro just for space. That means we are right now, or we, we right now have a unique selling proposition um, in space, especially in Europe, but as well worldwide. And with this new equipment and these new buildings um, and these new machines, we are um, right now a very big player in, in Europe for space and have built up a quite big environment um, for space. But looking at these products, obviously uh, when you talk about composite materials, the most important thing for space is probably its weight, not the only important thing, is durability also. So can you tell us how you come to this design and what the composite is composed of? Yeah. So the, comp the, the, the honeycomb cores are mainly composed of, um, you see here, aluminum. This is an aluminum honeycomb core, or the um, aramide fibers, glass fibers with uh, resin inside. And yeah, actually the uh, most um, uh, important thing is then getting the requirements from the customers. So our main customers are, for example, the well-known OEMs like Boeing, Airbus, especially in Europe, for example, Thales, Alenia Space, or OHB, of course. And um, yeah, with these requirements, we go then to our center of excellence and we go into start the prototyping, designing, support, everything. So the entire range of um, engineering, starting from the prototyping up to theory production, is going to uh, make in at Eurocomposite here in, in Luxembourg. And finally, why are you supporting Asteroid Day? 
Yes, so uh, basically um, Eurocomposite is quite interested in participating um, about the um, awareness enhancement uh, about asteroids, especially in the entire society and especially the um, community in Luxembourg. Um, like, how can asteroids pave the future exploration missions in the universe, as well how can we use the resources from asteroids, and as well, I think this is also quite important to say how can we protect our Earth in the future for asteroids' impacts. Um, as well, one important point is to mention that uh, Eurocomposite is quite interested, and also we think that it's a kind of responsibility for Eurocomposite as one, as one of the biggest industry in Luxembourg, um, yeah, to attract the young generation to work in and for space because we think that the space industry here in Luxembourg will in the future be a key role and will play a key role in Luxembourg and in the entire environment. Thank you so much, Christoph, for your time and for bringing in these wonderful samples of what goes up, not just in our aircraft, but also in many space materials, whether it be satellite or rockets. We'll have a short break now and be back with you shortly. Dr. Ed Liu has been to space four times and during one mission lived on the International Space Station for five months. With a bird's eye view of the moon and the many craters caused by asteroids, he reminds us that our Earth is impacted more than the moon. Asteroid Day Live is the only programming dedicated to introducing you to many of the most prominent asteroid experts in the world. We learn by listening to them share their personal experiences and knowledge of how our solar system was formed, how it is evolving, and how we can protect our beautiful blue planet. But this programming wouldn't be possible without the generous support of major sponsors, including the government of Luxembourg and you. You play a critical role in our ability to shine a bright spotlight on the leading work of astronomers, engineers, scientists, space mission operators, and astronauts, our global rock stars, who bring the topic of asteroids closer to people of all ages and remind our government leaders of the importance of funding planetary science. Asteroids play an important role in our lives, from the formation of our solar system to their extraordinary value for future resource utilization to enabling ongoing exploration of our solar system, and finally, when they impact our home planet. Asteroid Day is more than just a broadcast program. It's thousands of independently organized events in 192 countries. These events are the heart and soul of Asteroid Day, as they connect and engage students on the subject of asteroids. For many students across the world, Asteroid Day is their only opportunity to listen to, learn from, and to meet astronomers, astrophysicists, and astronauts, heroes of the STEM generation. Your support enables the growth of our network of independent event organizers so more events can take place. It allows us to not only encourage the future generation of scientists, but to grow our online library of educational tools, enabling more people to dig deep and to connect to scientists, observers, and astronauts. Your support enables us to meet the goals of the United Nations Office for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space Affairs by generating awareness of what we can do to protect our planet. Please consider becoming part of this movement by donating to Asteroid Day today. Asteroid Day Live shares with us the personal stories and knowledge of asteroid experts, scientists, astrophysicists, business leaders, and even artists, teaching us that to truly understand the origins of our solar system, we have to study it from various perspectives. Asteroid Day Live is the only programming dedicated to introducing you to many of the most prominent asteroid experts in the world. We learn by listening to them share their personal experiences and knowledge of how our solar system was formed, how it is evolving, and how we can protect our beautiful blue planet. 
But this programming wouldn't be possible without the generous support of major sponsors, including the government of Luxembourg and you. You play a critical role in our ability to shine a bright spotlight on the leading work of astronomers, engineers, scientists, space mission operators, and astronauts, our global rock stars, who bring the topic of asteroids closer to people of all ages and remind our government leaders of the importance of funding planetary science. Asteroids play an important role in our lives, from the formation of our solar system to their extraordinary value for future resource utilization to enabling ongoing exploration of our solar system, and finally, when they impact our home planet. Asteroid Day is more than just a broadcast program. It's thousands of independently organized events in 192 countries. These events are the heart and soul of Asteroid Day, as they connect and engage students on the subject of asteroids. For many students across the world, Asteroid Day is their only opportunity to listen to, learn from, and to meet astronomers, astrophysicists, and astronauts, heroes of the STEM generation. Your support enables the growth of our network of independent event organizers so more events can take place. It allows us to not only encourage the future generation of scientists, but to grow our online library of educational tools enabling more people to dig deeper into asteroids and to connect to scientists, observers, and astronauts. Your support enables us to meet the goals of the United Nations Office for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space Affairs by generating awareness of what we can do to protect our planet. Please consider becoming part of this movement by donating to Asteroid Day today.